Hey, we're back. Um, I waited a day, overnight, had a good sleep. Um, this is the, it's actually the same shirt I wore yesterday. Maybe I didn't wait 24 hours. You know what? I didn't. I probably waited maybe two and a half hours. And this glue in my spline looks like it's pretty solid. So I'm going to run this through because I was able to get one frame already done, but I wanted to watch, uh, I wanted you to watch me uh, clean this one up. So let's take a look. Last time we glued these splines into that spline opening, and you're going to notice something. Some of these splines, and actually they're all different in terms of how much is sticking out past. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plane this down. I said I could take a chisel, I could use a scraper, but I could take a hand plane and put this into the vise and actually start to plane this spline even with this outside surface. And our question is going to come up really soon this time. And it has to do with the direction that I always plane a spline. And this is absolutely paramount. If you put a spline in a picture frame, the worst thing you could possibly do after you glue it in is you take the plane, which is a chisel at a 45 degree angle, and instead of going into the miter and into the miter, you go out of the miter. In other words, if I were to take this hand plane and plane in this direction, I'm going away from the frame, and that's a major issue, because if I do that, the grain is running in this direction, it would cause this spline to chip. And I'm gonna tell you right now, no matter how well you glue it in, it's gonna chip into that groove that you made. So what you always wanna do is make sure that you're always pl planing into the picture frame. I always call it into the spline. In other words, I'm gonna take my plane, put it on here, and I'm gonna go in this direction. And if I go across here, you notice this, this is kind of a pain. This isn't a very easy thing. Well, I'm not bending my knees for one. The second thing is I have a lot to plane, although I really like to do this. I'm gonna maybe cut my workload in half or maybe more by taking this frame over to the band. So I'm gonna cut off this excess and we'll see how well I do with planing it when it's a little bit closer. So again, with the bandsaw, I'm going to lay this flat and I'm going to put the blade on the side that I want to cut, which is the spline. And we always talked about planing, I'm sorry, cutting in uh, to the line, leave the line. Well, your line this time is this frame. If you touch the frame with that bandsaw blade, it's not going to be square as you glued it together. You're actually going to have saw cuts on it. So if you make a mistake, by cutting this on the frame, uh, your frame is not gonna look nearly as polished. So what I wanna do is make sure that I cut some off, but I'm not cutting close to that frame. You know what? Maybe I shouldn't screw up. Time for the bifocal. Oh yeah. So if you look at when I'm cutting, if I cut here, obviously way too much. So I'm gonna cut, I come close to that edge, but I don't make contact with that frame at all. That's exactly where I wanna be. But I took off a lot of material and I saved myself a lot of work by planning it. Like I said, even though I love to plane splines. Do this for each corner. Although this one's pretty close. Did I cut the frame? Nope, still good. Still good. Good, good. This is the last one I'm gonna do. And again, I haven't touched the frame, which is exactly where I wanna be. All set. The other thing you notice is that when I was making those cuts, that waste piece was shooting out like crazy. Why was that? Because that spline is raised up above the table. So when it's cut, 
and it goes completely through the spline, the spline drops down and it gets shot out. Not that that's a big deal. And it's certainly not a kickback issue, especially if you have your safety glasses. I'm gonna take my bifocals, put them away. Now I'm gonna plane this. Let's see if we can do it the right way now. The paramount thing when you're planning into a spline or into a miter or into the picture frame is to make sure you have a super sharp hand plane. And sharpening comes part and parcel with everything that you do in here. If that is dull, just like I showed you with the chisel, it becomes more work, it's not gonna come out as good, and it could also become a safety issue. I'm gonna put the corner that I'm gonna work with right into my vise, it's supported here. I'm never gonna plane an area that's not supported by the vise. I'm gonna take my hand plane, something that my father showed me, Instead of keeping the hand plane straight, I don't know why, but I always hold it at an angle. So I'm kind of shearing the cut when I make it. And just like when I was scraping and I was pulling it back and then lifting it up, this is gonna kind of be the opposite. I'm gonna push down as I go forward and lift it when I come back because the hand plane is cutting on its first stroke. So I'm gonna push down, lift it up and come back. All of that, I'm gonna do that with myself bending my knees and my hand plane at a slight angle. If you have a sharp hand plane, you should hear that. It should be, almost be a whooshing sound as I go across there. So now the question becomes, when do I know that I'm done? When I start to see little sections of that cherry frame, that's completely done. And if you want, you could feel this Cameraman, do you want to feel that? Get your finger. That's perfect. I couldn't sand it any smoother than that. So now the question is, how do I do this side? I'm gonna take it, just simply flip this over, and this way, that miter supported by the vise, and now I can plane. I know what some of you guys are saying. Hey, he didn't cut that one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, because if you do it this way, wish, 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 wish. Like I'm wishing down the hill. I get to the very end, my goodness, if you feel that, that's pretty even. I think I did another, another good job with that. Like I said, this was one of the three things that I like to do in my life. Somebody asked me what the other two were, I'm not going there. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. You cannot just stand here and cut like this and expect to, uh, the, the hand tool to make this into this gorgeous cut. It all has to do with associating with the tool. The only way that happens is you gotta use it. Nothing wrong with picking up a pine board and planing a pine board down and getting to know this hand plane because it could just be a scrap piece that you plane, but it's gonna make you a better woodworker. Oh man, do they look good. This one. Always, again, into the frame. I'm always planing into the frame. And if you look at that, how sharp that looks, man, that looks good. So I wouldn't bore you with this. You hear the sound, the whooshing sound? I did the other frame before. Did I do that? Yep. And I have one more to go. Bend your knees, pushing down as I go forward. It's weird because people say to me, how do you do that? And you're trying to describe something that's second nature to you. It's very difficult. I just hold it at an angle. And it's almost like you're 
tapping in time to hear John Denver sing, Thank God I'm a Country Boy. This frame is done, done, done and done. Take a look at this one. Same thing. These miters have been planed, and I did that before you came. What's the next step? Well, to tell you the truth, the next step is kind of the next to last step. And that is, I don't like this ooh, sharp edge. There's a sharp edge on that frame. I don't like it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the router table and I'm going to put a new bit on so that I have a nice, clean cutting surface to work with. And what I want to do is I want to put a shape on this. Common mistake that people make is they always think that more elaborate is better. On so many of the frames that I make, all I want to do is have that kind of shadow box look where it's deep. And all I want to do is blend this in. In simplicity, that's really the secret. That's the beauty. The beauty is in the simplicity. So if you look at this, I just want to go around here, around here, around here, around there with the router. And it's going to be a rounding over bit, which is the bit that we use the most. I don't know if you guys remember this, but when we were making our cheese boards, I used a rounding over bit to get that radius, and I called it bull nose because I did it on the outside and then on the underside. Um, on this one, what we're going to do is just round it over on the outside and then leave the back side because that's just going to go up against the wall. So after I round, my project is going to look like this. It's going to be rounded over on the outside. I hope to do a better job of sanding. And I'm just going to leave it so that you see the spine. So let's take a walk over to the old router table. We'll bring the frames and we'll see if we can't make these into a couple of memories. I mentioned to you about the bit. I noticed that when I routed the last time, the bit was pretty dull. So what I want to do is change the bit. But I also want to kind of convey to you guys how similar taking the bit out of here is to working on our spindle sander. I said there were two wrenches on the spindle sander. One locks the armature in place. The other one is on the underside of the spindle. And you move that top wrench towards the window or away from you if you're standing here or counterclockwise. Remember on the table saw, so it was just the opposite. So what I want to do is I want to take that bit out. I'm actually going to toss that bit because it's seen its better day. And I want to put this rounding over bit in because this one feels a little bit sharper. I'm going to take this one, place this here. I want to get the wrench that I'm going to use to get underneath that router table, which happens to be this wrench, which goes with this Makita router down here. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put the wrench on the nut, but I have to kind of work from the underside. But this is something that when someone says to me, I wanna put a chamfer bit on, I wanna put a bead and cove bit on, I wanna put an OG bit on. Well, everybody has to wait for me to change the bit. How cool would it be if you did it? And this is no different than if you were to do it at home. The only thing that's slightly different is that we have a router table here that we're working on, which saves us tons of time instead of having people clamp their wood. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get down on my knee and kind of show you something about this router. I'll switch places with you. You guys can go on to that side. Just like I was working on the table saw, what I want you to understand is that if I take my hands and put it in here, and God forbid somebody walks by this switch and turns it on, my fingers will be turned into coleslaw. I don't wanna have that happen. So what I wanna do is I wanna unplug this router. If you look, we have a router mounted on the underside of the table, and then there's just a regular electrical switch over here. If I unplug this here, not at the wall, now if I go to turn this on, the router won't go on. So that's the kind of safety measure I want. I don't want to take any chances with my fingers because like I said, you only get 10 of them. That's it. It's not like a lobster where it grows back. I'm going to take my wrench. I'm going to put it on the underside of the router. But the other thing that for me makes this a little bit easier is if I kind of look from the top and see what I'm doing here. This router has a pin that's located on the underside. Let me take you to the front of the router and let me point to you the pin that's here. 
This pin will lock the armature in place. Remember, if I put the wrench directly on this nut and turn, everything turns. I want to turn the wrench so that only the bit loosens up. So I'm going to turn this, depress the pin, and you could hear how that locks in place. This happens to be with this Makita router. Now I'm going to take my open end wrench, put it on my nut, and it depends. If I'm on this side, that becomes an issue because I'm pulling it towards me. I want to put the wrench so I'm kind of putting all the torque away from me. I hold on to the pin and I'm going to push that counterclockwise. So right there, the nut loosened up. Now coming from the top, on this particular router, if I spin it, if I spin the nut, it'll tighten again. Now it's tightened again. I'm going to take the wrench one more time, go back underneath here, turn it counterclockwise, and now I'll drop the wrench purposely. Yeah, right. I can lift the bit and it'll come completely off. So when you loosen it on this particular Makita router, it'll tell you you loosen it once and then loosen it again and it, it should come into play. I'm going to move um, this rounding over bit, put it onto my router. I'm going to set it to a certain height. I put it about midway down. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the wrench, and instead of moving it counterclockwise, I'm going to move it clockwise. So again, I'll position the wrench so it's most favorable for me to turn it. Right, right, come on, baby, right there. I take it, I turn it so it's nice and tight and snug, and I'm all set. So there's my new bit that's in the router. I'm going to take this one, and we'll kind of, kind of jettison this one. The next thing that I want to do is I want to set the radius of this router, this radius part right here, to be directly even with the, the, the height of the router table. The purpose of that is just to give me a profile, a 3 8 profile along that outside edge. When I do that, I'm going to do it by eye. So I'm going to kind of sight down here. I'm going to look down here. I'm going to put on two pair of glasses because I don't want to be wrong with this. And it looks like my router has to be dropped down. So I'm going to loosen up this little table lock. And on my router, this particular one, this crank wheel will drop the router down. I dropped it a little too far. Let me raise it up just a little bit. Right there looks pretty good. I tap it just to make sure that the router doesn't get caught up anywhere. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze my little clamping lock in place. Just like I did on the table saw when I was cutting my spline, the last thing I want to do is just come over here and blindly route my frame. Because if I screw up, it means I'm going to have to redo something on that. So I'm going to take a piece of scrap wood. And what I'll do is I'll make that cut on the piece of scrap wood. I'll see how it lines up. If it lines up well, then I'll go ahead and I'll do all four sides of both picture frames. So now what I need to find is the table, I'm sorry, the fence that goes on to here. Hmm. 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 Oh, here it is. This router table has saved us tons of time. And I thank Derek Nagel for making this router table. When he was a student and he was also a teacher here, he took his time to make this and we've been using it ever since. And that was many years ago. But I thank Derek for doing such a nice job and for allowing us to save tons of time with every student who comes through the shop. So what I'm going to do is just sort of lock down the fence in place. And this gives me the added advantage of being able to take an edge and putting it up against something so that the frame doesn't move. I'm going to take my frame, I'm going to turn the router on, and I'm going to send it through. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. What am I going to do first? Huh. 
I said I was going to do it on a piece of scrap wood. Yes, 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 I know. Brent told me, I told you, yes, yes, I've got the story. No, I have to plug the router back in. Remember, I changed the bit. Oh, sleeping on the job, eh? I see, rabbit. I'm going to plug this in. Of course, oh, wrong way. I'll take my wires, put those away. I'm going to turn this on. It should go on. Like Herman Munster. And now what I want to do is get a piece of scrap wood and just route that edge and see what it looks like because that's what I'm going to get from my frame. I happen to have a piece of poplar here. Oops, somebody used a, a bead and cove bit, which I like, but definitely would be too busy for my little frame. If you imagine this on this, that's way too busy a shape. To me, like I said, the beauty is in the simplicity. Bop, bop, bop. I have a piece of scrap pine. The thickness really doesn't matter. Well, it's, the thickness does. It's similar to my hardwood, but all I want to see is that I get a profile on this surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the router table on. It takes this edge, put it up against the fence. It's like I'm using the table saw. My right thumb's on the back end. Leave the rolled up, safety glass is on. Keep the stock up against the fence. I'm just going to turn it in. is that this is a perfect radius. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. What would you say? Oops. Nope. It's not because there's a lip there. So the bit is actually set too high up. So what I want to do is still lower the bit to just get the radius. I don't want to see that lip on there. To me, it makes the whole frame look too busy. So all I'm gonna do is loosen up that little clamping lock. I'm gonna take the handle, I'm gonna move it counterclockwise so it drops down a little bit. I just tap it to make sure that it seats where it's supposed to do or, or be, and I'll tighten down the clamp lock again. Let me try it again. I'll do it on this edge this time. better than it was before. How's that? Well, I heard it. No, it still stinks. There's still a little lip there. It's a lot better than this lip, but I'm going to drop the table yet again. So I'll loosen up the, the clamp again, move my adjustment down a little bit. And you know, the funny thing about this is I'm kind of running out of edges. I still have this edge. I'll try this side. And I think that's kind of what I'm after. That's that radius, that 3 8 radius where it just blends it in. All I want to do is cut that edge off. So that's what I'm going to do to my two frames. The question a lot of people say is, is there a certain way that you do this? If you were routing an entire board which had edges and ends, you'd always do the ends first and always do the edges next. On this one, it really does not matter. All I want to do is start from a certain position. Again, I want to put the frame down and work my way. And I'm going to say it's going to be counterclockwise as I look at the frame on the table. The other thing that I want to do is make sure that as I'm pushing across here, when I get to this point, there's a tendency for this frame to drop down. I want to make sure I keep a lot of pressure up against the fence so that when I'm cutting, all this board stays flat down on the router table. The advantage to the router table, as opposed to clamping it down and using a handheld router, a handheld router to me is more dangerous because you're actually using a machined obstacle in your way. If I take this and I clamp and I leave the router table down, I don't have to clamp anything and my hands are a little free to move. How, how much time did you say, cameraman? 25 minutes? I better get through this. Take my board, keep it flat. 
Here's the routed one. You notice the routed one looks a little bit thinner because I broke that edge, which is what I want. Remember, I don't want to have this frame overpower my picture. So right here, that looks pretty good. All I have to do is I have to route this one and then I'll be all set to sand it. So I think I'm pretty much done here. I'm not going to take your time and have you watch me route something that I already did. One thing I will tell you is when you're routing to avoid burn marks, to avoid burn marks, try to keep the wood constantly moving. If you stop and you have a dull bit, especially if you have a dull bit, that will definitely leave a burn mark. And burn marks don't look nearly as good as natural knots. So I'll finish routing and then I'll take the next 25 minutes to show you guys how to sand, right? No. I wouldn't do that with my worst enemy. I'll finish routing, I'll sand it up, and then I'll polyurethane that. Maybe the next time I could squeeze in those cheese boards to finish those up. You guys have a great day and I'll be in touch.